Hi everyone, welcome to Module 8. This week we're going to talk about cloud computing and specifically cloud security. At this point in the class you're going to start to see all the lecture videos are going to be coming from me now so you won't hear from Professor Ching anymore. We're going to start to touch on some of the topics that I mentioned at the beginning of the semester in the syllabus. So sort of an update to the course to reflect some of the more modern topics in computing and computer security. What is cloud computing? I think nowadays many people have different definitions of what cloud computing actually is. Uh, if you ask data scientists, they may have a very, very different view of what cloud computing is than if you were to ask, say, an infrastructure engineer or a network engineer or someone like that. For our case, uh, the cloud computing, as you can see here, provides virtually endless supply of IT resources. Um, so some of the things that computers commonly provide, like computational power, uh, network capabilities, RAM, databases, a whole slew of applications um, that users might find useless. Um, basically all aggregated together and accessed over the web. And so you're probably familiar with many of the large cloud service providers. Amazon uh, has a service called Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, Microsoft's cloud is called Azure, uh, you'll find that in sim they're, they're similar in, in many, many ways, but there are some differences uh, in the major CSPs as well. So cloud computing has really taken off. I'm sure you, you hear the term all the time now. And there are some tremendous benefits of cloud computing over traditional data center computing. And I decided to try to list in what are in my mind the top six here. So one of the major things is cost. In the cloud environment, you literally only pay for the resources that you use as you use them. So Amazon, for example, Amazon charges you for EC2, which is their, uh, their compute cloud. Um, you pay by the hour for a virtual machine in that cloud. And basically, the, the model works that the larger of an instance you have, meaning the more compute power it has and the more memory it has, the higher of an hourly rate you're going to pay. Um, they also build in things like licensing. So if you're using a Windows OS versus a Linux OS, you're going to wind up paying much more to cover the Windows licensing costs that Amazon's responsible for. Something that's pretty neat, there's a service in uh, AWS called EMR, which is their Elastic Map Reduce. And lots of scientific laboratories, including NASA, are using these at really, really large scale. And it can potentially be expensive. So in order to minimize their cost, there is a, a mode of billing that allows you to bid for compute time. And so what NASA engineers do is they, they place bids dynamically throughout the day, and they obtain their compute power at times when the, the cloud has it priced the lowest. So what usually happens is net, groups like NASA, when they run, want to run a large-scale analytic, um, they're their machine learning robot basically will bid on compute power, which usually tends to be overnight. It will spin the infrastructure up, it will run the analytic, produce some results, and then when they get outbid, um, they're fine with their compute power basically just going away. Um, so kind of a neat trick that the companies will use to pay the smallest possible hourly rate. Redundancy is also something that is really, really big in the cloud. And AWS has something called availability zones, for example. Um, so within each region that they have, a region you can think of as their, their highest level container for compute resources. Uh, so Northern Virginia is one of their most popular regions. Within the Northern Virginia region, they have a number of availability zones. So AZ1, AZ2, I uh, believe up through AZ4. The availability zones are actually different physical locations so that if you have a virtual machine running in availability zone one and it goes down, um, it actually replicates itself behind the scenes for you to other availability zones. So that way there's no single point of failure. Um, scalability is also something I think we hear a lot of. AWS allows you to do things with a product that they call ELB, which is their elastic load balancer. And the elastic load balancer is able to dynamically measure um, the number of requests that are coming into your application and it can actually spin up new uh, instances of web servers or new instance of application servers 
um, based on how hard you're being hit at, at the current time. Um, and all that's done for you based on uh, metrics that you can set up ahead of time. Um, but the scaling out, meaning scaling up the addition of infrastructure is done on the fly for you. Um, let's jump to the lower right and kind of compare that to, to elasticity because they're related. When we talk about elasticity, it's slightly different than scalability because it's not just sufficient enough to scale up in times of need, but we also need to scale down um, when traffic spikes subside. So if you ever hear the term elasticity, um, it means scaling up or down uh, to meet the current demand for your application automatically. So that's another nice feature of the cloud. It's very difficult to install a new physical server um, into a data center. So the fact that you can just stand these instances up and then just scale back down and then in the process stop paying for the extra computation power. Um, we call that elasticity, which is another nice feature of the cloud. And also along those lines, I decided to list speedy development here. I have an infrastructure background and I can tell you that building a data center takes a lot of work. Um, it's very expensive. It's difficult to do right. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to find the manpower capable of building that infrastructure. Uh, when you build a cloud application or a cloud infrastructure, you're basically just doing things at the click of the mouse that would take you hours, days, or weeks to do inside of an actual data center. So the time to concept is, is much, much speedier um, in the cloud than it is in a traditional data center computing environment. And then from a security perspective, there are many ups and many drawbacks when it comes to security. Um, so all the servers obviously in the cloud, you don't have physical access to. So this, since the servers are offsite, physical security access becomes a concern, a number of other things. Uh, but many cloud service providers, again, Amazon and Microsoft, they, they provide really robust SLAs and they claim to keep your your computers up to date so you don't have to patch, you don't have to update OSs and do things of that nature. And the cloud providers try to bake that in and provide that level of security for you. So there's three main types of cloud computing and they basically just exist at different layers. Um, so we talked about infrastructure as a service a little bit on the previous slide. That's when we take the storage and the CPU and the networking and all those other things that we mentioned and we offer them up as a cloud service. So rather than having to rack and power and cool and pay the cost of a physical server um, and also risk that server eventually failing, the infrastructure of the service allows you to stand up a computer, a server, um, a database server, whatever you need at the click of just a few buttons. And the second that you need to add more RAM or more storage or more computation or add VLANs to your network, um, it becomes very, very, very easy to do. So we'll talk more about that in the coming slides. Software as a service, you may have heard this term quite a bit. I'm not sure if you're familiar with what it is, but rather than companies offering um, sort of an executable or a binary that you can download and install, many companies are obviously choosing to make their applications available through the web now. So think of things like Facebook, things like Google Drive, Gmail, right? These are not applications that you have to download. And so the nice thing about that um, is that you don't have to worry about users keeping their uh, versions of their applications up to date. And you don't have to worry about users not being able to access them because they're not at their own computer. And you can get to these software as a service type of applications since they're web-based anywhere you can get a web connection. That includes your phone in the car, if you're at a computer at work or a computer at home, or maybe even on a tablet in an airplane, it, it doesn't matter um, because the software is basically there um, as a service on the internet. And then the layer that basically sits between infrastructure and software as a service we call platform as a service. So this basically takes care of all the underlying infrastructure for you. So it will stand up a, a server and it will configure the networking and the storage um, however you uh, choose to configure it. But then it also installs things like it'll install your OS for you and then any application packages that your application might require. So if you're writing some type of scientific application in Python, 
Um, this will basically install things like SciPy, NumPy, um, any other additional libraries that you might need. So they're all baked in and you can deploy one of these platforms at the click of a button. So for example, if you wanted to install, or excuse me, if you wanted to launch a, a PHP application, the LAMP stack, which is Linux, you know, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, you can install the entire platform just at the click of a button and have all those underlying applications um, installed automatically for you. So how, is cloud, how are clouds actually built? Well, they're all based on virtualization. And you may be familiar with virtualization, but if not, I wanted to kind of show it here. The virtualization layer, it gets installed like an operating system, but it sits between the hardware and the operating system. And the nice thing that it does is it takes all the hardware components, so it takes your CPU and your disk and your RAM, things of that nature, and it basically aggregates them together in a single pool. And then on top of the hardware layer, you launch a, what's called a virtual machine. And the nice thing is you can launch many virtual machines be, because they use the hardware layer to access the hardware. So the hardware virtualization layer is basically the broker between the virtual machines and the amount of hardware that it needs. So you see here, there's two operating systems that are running on one physical server. And so the hardware virtualization layer may take those hardware resources, possibly say split them up in half, and make sure that the operating system on the upper left only accesses a certain half of the hardware, while the operating system on the upper right only accesses the other half of the hardware. And there'll never be any overlap, so there should be no contention between those two OSs for the physical hardware. Um, so the virtualization layer allows you to run many, many virtual machines on top of a single piece of hardware um, and again, it, it acts as the intermediary that processes the request from the operating system to the hardware. We actually call this layer a hypervisor, and um, one of the popular hypervisors is VMware ESX. And so you basically just install it from a disk like you would any operating system, but it has special kernel level access so that it can, um, again, act as that broker between the virtual machines and the hardware. I just wanted to touch on that again here. Some of the popular hypervisors you may have heard of, um, ESX is certainly probably the largest in terms of market share. Um, Oracle VirtualBox is a big one. It's a popular desktop hypervisor. And then Zen and KDM usually come baked into CentOS and Red Hat Linux. So you may have heard of those as well. So the, the reason I mentioned virtualization is because it's basically the, the precipice of, of a cloud. And so you can have many servers that provide virtualization, and what we call that is a cluster. So I think it's reasonable to expect to be able to run about 10 to 20 virtual machines on a single virtual server. But obviously 10 to 20 virtual machines is not enough to offer up to the internet. Amazon offers actually millions of virtual machines. So they take many, 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 many clusters and they actually cluster those all together. So you can think of many, many different data centers and then just place a layer on top of that that aggregates all of the compute power in those data centers together. And then when you make that accessible to people through the internet, they don't necessarily care where their virtual machine is operating, which cluster it's in, what kind of physical hardware is installed in the cluster. All I know is that at the click of a button, when they ask for a Windows virtual machine, two or three minutes later, they're given a key and a remote desktop session to a working um, Windows virtual machine. So to them, they use it just the same with no regard for what the underlying details are. And there's three public, or excuse me, there's three types of clouds that we talk about. Um, a private cloud is a cloud, maybe a cluster, could be a single virtual server, um, usually it's a cluster, and that hardware is maintained on-premises in your own data center. So the cluster is not being offered up for use by anyone else, so the security is much tighter in a private, cl a private cloud. Um, we contrast that with a public cloud, which is exactly what the Amazon type of cloud is. You do not have any physical access to it at all. And there are many different organizations that are probably using the same public cloud along with you. But again, 
you don't necessarily care about those details. All you care is that when you ask for a certain amount of resources in the public cloud, that, that that's available. And what many organizations are doing now, <clears throat> excuse me, what organizations do now is they're trying to jump into the public cloud, but many, many companies have private cloud infrastructure in existence already. So in order to bridge the gap, there are many tools, uh, Eucalyptus, which is an open source tool, is one of them. They connect your private cloud to your public cloud. And usually it's through some sort of VPN. So you can set up a VPN concentrator with your public cloud provider, and then you configure your own VPN router um, on your private network. And you can merge the two together so that virtual machines in the public cloud can communicate with virtual machines in your private cloud. So you can utilize your existing investment, basically, and merge the two um, into what's called a hybrid cloud. 